Hello. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for part of our McGuire Woods quarterly webinar series. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of having a panel discussion on dental oral surgery and orthodontic issues. We have several uh, key leaders in the space that have joined us alongside uh, Bart Walker at McGuire Woods, who is one of our frequent commentators that you've probably seen on these different webinar series. Um, my name is Kate Kayla McCann Marty, and I'll be moderating our webinar today as we go through a series of questions that will focus on key uh, issues from a transactional and an integration perspective in dental, oral surgery, and orthodontics. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And Bart Walker, for a partner at McGuire Woods, if you could just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your role on the panel. Sure. Thanks, Kayla, and uh, appreciate you setting this up and really leading the charge on this on this webinar. Uh, Jeremy, Eric, Justin, great to have you with us today. Uh, my name is Bart Walker. I'm a partner in the healthcare group with McGuire Woods. I'm also the co-chair of our healthcare and life sciences industry team. I um, also help lead efforts in the dental and DSO space uh, for the firm and end up doing about 80 to 90 percent of my time in the transactional world <clears throat> between M&A, joint ventures, buying and selling, uh, medical practices, physician practices, dental practices, DSOs, hospitals, all healthcare services. Um, and I've been doing that for almost 20 years now, uh, all with uh, McGuire Woods. So uh, thanks, thanks for having me. Or, Kayla, thanks for organizing it and, and pleased to have you guys with us today. Great, thank you. Our next panelist is Jeremy Garner with Southern Orthodontic Partners. Jeremy, if you can give a little bit of background about your experience in the space. Yeah, thanks a lot. This is exciting to put together. Appreciate appreciate it, uh, the organization. Uh, so Jeremy Garner, I'm the Chief Development Officer of Southern Orthodontic Partners. Southern Orthodontic Partners is based out of Nashville, Tennessee. We are celebrating our third birthday next month. Um, our financial sponsor is Shore Capital Partners, and we partner with orthodontic practices, uh, primarily in the Southeast, um, and look to provide them support, uh, grow them uh, through multiple levers and, and resources that we can provide to our, to our partners. So thanks for having me. Great. Um, our next panelist is Justin Mishaw. Um, he's with Chatham Oral and Maxiofacial Surgery. Justin, can you give us a little bit of your background? Absolutely, and yes, I also want to say thank you for having me on the panel today. Uh, looking forward to sharing what I can. I've been in the dental space now for 10 years. Um, I've really enjoyed applying my business knowledge and financial um, background to the dental industry, working also with Eric Moran, who's on here, and, and with the group at McGuire Woods as well on projects. Um, also the CEO of and founder of Wausau Sound, which is an, an MSO in the space of oral surgery, uh, but also, as you said, the, I'm the CEO of Chatham Oral and Maxofacial Surgery as well. So thank you for having me. Yes, thank you for joining us, Justin. And then last but certainly not least is Eric Moran with Tower Leadership. Eric, if you can just give us a little bit of your background. Oh, I think uh, we may have uh, had a little technical difficulty there. Eric, are you back with us? You got me? Yep. Yes, uh, we're, you're with us now. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. Glad to be here. Um, I'm a private business consultant, uh, MBA. I've been in this space for approximately 20 years. I came into it because I married a dentist um, and uh, started helping um, doctors grow uh, at a larger scale. The vast majority of our clients are, are group practices or, or people that are aspiring to be group practices. Um, so we work heavily in that space. We, we are uh, very involved in a lot of M&A work and uh, practices that are looking to grow large groups and, and, and grow a large trajectory. Um, so it, it, that, that's the majority of what we do is, is consult larger groups on, on, on this trajectory towards uh, or the DSO side. Great. 
Thank you all. So with that, we'll just jump right into our first uh, set of questions. And maybe, Jeremy, if I can just start with you on our first question, because you all have been very active in the market. How would you describe the current market conditions with respect to orthodontics, dental, and oral surgery? Yeah, speaking um, you know specifically to ortho- orthodontics, we have um, there's a lot of activity occurring in the space, um, and I know that our uh, private equity sponsor also has investments in the the dental and oral surgery space as well. Um, but at SOP, we're strictly orthodontics, and you know consolidation to orthodontics is, is pretty new to the space, um, unlike other specialties or hospital systems or surgery centers. Um, It's still a relatively new concept in orthodontics. And so there's a lot of white space out there. I'd say about 15% of the industry right now is is consolidated. Um, And you're seeing more and more OSOs and and OSOs, DSOs, or DSOs that have an orthodontic component come online. I think a lot of that has to do with changing in the business, the, the world changes quickly. And, and so it does it in orthodontists. You know, I, I had braces uh, 25 years ago and I think my, my orthodontist, uh, you know, his, his marketing strategy was sponsor the little league team. And now you have the power of digital marketing and the iPhone and the Android and people type in orthodontist near me or Invisalign or braces. And if you're not, First to show up on that search, you're you're already behind. So we see that changing. We see the appetite uh, for young doctors coming out of training and uh, and wanting ownership and another practice changing. Um, the generation coming out today has so much debt, and they're really interested in just becoming an orthodontist and practicing, and not having the nuances of being a small business owner. And so those changes in the landscape fresh consolidation, lots of white space. Um, it's been a very uh, frothy environment with a lot of uh, M&A now and into the future. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, Justin, if I can just go to you next, you would agree that you've seen a lot of the same trends in the dental and oral surgery space. But I'd love to hear your perspective if there's any elements that may be unique or things that you've seen just really ring true of what Jeremy just mentioned with respect to interest in the space. Absolutely. And thank you, Jeremy. I agree with everything that he said, the same kind of uh, situation going on in the oral surgery area of the business. Many of the doctors coming out are, uh, again, high debt, uh, student debt. They want to get in. They want to, they want to make um, that. They want to bring home the, the income that they need for that right away without coming out of school and trying to make a large investment into some sort of partnership. However, there are methods for that. Um, also, uh, you know, the current market conditions to come out and run, um, and you operate your own business and take that leap. Many of them are, are, are interested in joining in a group or joining in an organization or platform. And from what I'm seeing anyways in the oral surgery sector, we also are seeing, yeah, that, that area um, many different organizations coming into that. And, and so I think that the current market conditions, you know, the other questions I could elaborate on more uh, about, you know, how COVID affected that and such, but uh, I'll turn that back over to you. Absolutely. And if I can just, uh, turn to Eric and Bart because you all are frequently more on the advisor side, less on the business development side, but you get to see a lot of the growth around different acquisitions and you've been very active in the space for several years. How have you seen the space evolve over, let's say, the last 10 years with respect to platform and add-on acquisitions? Eric, you want to go first? I would say... I, it's interesting. You said 10 years, but I would say the last five years, what's happened is dramatic because we it, just in the last five years, you've seen the complexity of just the 
the owner operator change dramatically in, in their own acumen and um, their drive desire. You, you've seen we've seen changes in associates and what they're looking for. Uh, I mean, major shifts in, in the models and the business models. And where a shoebox of receipts was even great five years ago, the complexity in, as you said, marketing, the complexity in financial investments, the complexity into acquisitions, um, the marketplace is is more ready than ever to take advantage of those things. So the, the owner operator the, of the small dental practice who's not really ready to come against that marketplace, there's a lot of challenges. And I think those challenges are a lot to overcome. And so for that reason, I think that's also one of the reasons why people wanting to be an, a, you know, more on the associate side than an owner operator, because being an owner operator, not only do you have debt, but there's marketplace challenges that you just didn't have five years ago. Yeah, a couple of innovations. I think um, from an M&A perspective, a lot of the acquirers have gotten better at integration. I think when we first saw this, you call it 10 years ago, everyone was scrambling for scale as quickly as humanly possible. And it was a time characterized largely by sellers having unrealistic expectations around value and valuation. Um, There's just this chasm between what buyers were willing to pay for a smaller add-on versus a large platform style deal and what sellers' expectations were. Um, I think that gap has closed considerably, especially for those practice owners who are um, talking to the right folks, I suppose. Uh, I think there's still some people who have unrealistic expectations as with any anyone selling anything or looking to partner an asset. Um, but on the integration side, we've seen buyers get a lot more sophisticated, a lot more streamlined, a lot more efficient with onboarding practices, onboarding new providers, whether it's credentialing, HR benefits, technology, financial backend solutions, all of which I think now are really viewed as table stakes for having a platform that would command platform level valuations. Um, that's been an evolution that we've seen over the last, you know, to Eric's point, probably five years, but going back 10 years, even even more so. Yeah, absolutely. And I think some of uh, what has forced some of those evolutions have been the ways in which consumers consume goods differently during COVID uh, through social media, like Jeremy mentioned. So I would be remiss if we didn't focus a little bit on how COVID has changed the business model. And I suspect what we're going to hear from Jeremy it might be different than what we hear from Justin. So if I can just maybe go to Justin first on this question, because you mentioned it earlier, is how COVID has really changed the evolution of acquisitions and the evolution of how your business model rolls out to different consumers. Well, you know, how COVID has changed that, at least in the oral surgery uh, arena, you know, sure, balancing too many restrictions or too little restrictions and how the public perceives that. Obviously, we there was a lot, uh, there was many, much more communication that needed to happen to, to patients. And, and as far as how COVID um, affected the industry from a, an acquisition standpoint, I think Again, the stress of balancing all of that while also being an owner operator, uh, you know, increase the level of stress of running your own business uh, with that added element. So, you know, many other of of the oral surgery practice uh, independent owners are open to having a management organization come in and take over the day to day operations, um, the administrative, uh, administrative operations of the organization, allow them to focus on what they enjoy to do, which is take care of patients and let uh, a management service organization handle all that increased communication. And and again, um, balancing that public perception of, are you do you have enough restrictions? Uh, did you remove your mask mandate now in your office or did you not? And when it gets down to even just those daily operating decisions, and should you do that now or should you not? And how will that be perceived by the public? Having a bigger organization where you can bounce those ideas off and, and, and share best practices. And I think that's where, how it has affected at least the, the individuals that I've spoken with pertaining to COVID in the industry. 
Absolutely. And, and Jeremy, I think that you've had a really unique experience uh, that you all really grew up as a platform in many ways right through COVID, which is a very admirable but unique. Uh, so if you don't mind to speak a little bit to the acquisition climate and your all's growth strategy through COVID and uh, how that may have changed what you would have done otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. And a, and a lot of similar responses to, to Justin. Our, our first partner that we added on outside of our founders literally uh, closed with us, closed as in joined us um, the week that the world was shutting down uh, two years ago in, in March. And so I would say COVID really shook up the space and uh, scared the, uh, the, the small business owner. Um, you know, you had this 100 year pandemic and businesses are closing left and right states have different regulation on what you can and can't do and so we found a lot of doctors in the midst of covid or coming out of covid responding with that really shook me up i don't want to have to go through that again i want the backing of a larger group of professionals who can tell me how to navigate these turbulent waters, whether that be from uh, thinking about, um, you know, personal protection within the, within the uh, practice, um, taking care of team members that you may have to furlough uh, back in the, in the deep depths of COVID. And so um, we were, uh, we, we've seen that just that response throughout the, the platform and at SOP, you know, all of our doctors are shareholders. So we're all cheering each other on and, and rooting for one another. And so it's it's collaboration of best practices and what they're seeing in those practices. And I think there's a big sense of security that you're no longer on an island. And certainly when we were uh, deep into COVID, if you were by yourself, the doctors were feeling that. Yeah, absolutely. And Bart, maybe if I can go to you next, I think you have answered very different questions in potential acquisitions since COVID. And you've uh, talked with different operators about the very different issues. If you could just touch a little bit on how you've seen COVID affect your clients. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd really just echo some of the things Jeremy touched on and, and Justin before him on um, suddenly you wake up one day and supply chain matters, right? Um, access to capital matters. Um, I, I think some of the folks we've spoken to that's been really interesting have been those that were in states that were particularly shut down during the pandemic that had to evolve the practice in some way to more fully adopt things like teledentistry or to look for new and innovative ways to expand beyond just traditional dental care and hygiene <clears throat> into areas where, especially for particular populations that are difficult to serve, like Medicaid-based patients or indigent patients, where um, you can provide more than just dental. You can provide kind of general health screenings and, and greater frequency of touch points throughout the year for those types of populations that you really need to have more consistent touch points with. So. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily a silver lining, but those are some of the issues that we've seen people grappling with and actually finding some opportunities in here into ways that they can grow and continue to evolve post pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Eric, that's a good transition uh, to a question that I wanted to ask you, which is about lessons learned during the pandemic that weren't just triage lessons, but lessons that your clients can apply um, in the future that actually may make them more efficient, more productive um, in operating even a better business, either in the oral surgery, dental or orthodontic space. Uh, do you mind to just speak on that for a moment? <clears throat> Absolutely. And I actually think it actually goes in hand to hand with the other question because, and, and it was just brought up, which is this idea of access to capital and having capital. Before COVID, I felt like I was ringing a bell telling people, you need to have capital, you need to have access to capital. And we saw, especially on the private side, a, a tremendous amount of uh, doctors taking on debt, but had low capital positions, low access to capital, hadn't looked at it for a long time because they had the ability to get capital quite easily. But during COVID, 
when before the PPP, you started to see people realize the impact of not having capital, not having access to capital. And so afterwards, that conversation was a much easier conversation to have, is that people understood, I need to make sure at all times I have the ability to get capital and that I have some accumulation within the business. And I saw that as one of the greatest changes in the mindsets and the shifts of these businesses is realizing how important that asset was before COVID. I didn't they, they, I said it, but they didn't hear me as well because it wasn't an issue. When it became an issue, they saw the importance of it. And now when we're having those conversations about the importance of it and how to invest it within the business and, and what the return is, um, those conversations have changed. There's a different uh, um, acumen around it and people are much, w much more willing to set aside capital or do the things they need to to have access to capital so that they can make the investments for the growth and be prepared just in case something happens. Yeah, absolutely. And I think tied to the access to capital is the tie to professional management. Um, those two things often come hand in hand from a cash management perspective. Um, Jeremy, if I can just go back to you on this question, because I think you mentioned this earlier, was the openness of independent providers to professional management and also the openness that once a practice is integrated into a management structure, to allow professional management to assist in making changes, whether it be through supply ordering, uh, data and analytics, outreach and technology. Um, if you could just speak a little bit about how, how that becoming more accustomed to professional management is really occurring in the market, but also uh, providers yeah. are realizing ways in which it can be very helpful. Yeah, great question. I, you know, it's a lot of it is, is trust with the doctor. So, Without without our doctors, we're we're a, a an office with a lot of windows. We the doctors and their teams are the asset, and SOP um, is in the business of growing their partners, growing together. So it's about joining something bigger, collaboration, and working with others. Our model is not we're going to come in. We want you to straighten teeth Monday through Thursday, and leave. we still want you to very much to be the CEO of your practice. However, with our access to capital, whether it be in de novos, whether it be leveraging group purchasing of supplies, um, uh, yeah, better prices on uh, aligners or, or brackets, um, everyone is uh, incentivized to continue to grow because that's what gives uh, our shareholders a great economic return. It's not about adding practices, it's about adding practices, providing support, and then to continue to provide organic growth and support them. And so if we run across a doctor that says, you know, I, I really like what I'm doing, I just kind of want to join you guys and be left alone, not a good fit for us. Um, not our, uh, now our model is not to come in and, and change the way that they're uh, um, treating their patients or changing their culture. We, we are making an investment because they've been successful in that. But you have to be willing to um, be interested in learning and working with others uh, in a group like us. Absolutely. And, and Justin, I suspect that you've seen very similar trends in your experience, but I'd love to hear if you've seen any distinguishing factors in oral surgery or any particular elements of oral surgery that are pain points that professional management have been able to come in and help solve. Yes, absolutely. And, and around the, the, you know, the lessons we've learned from COVID, the, 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 the question here, I can remember sitting in a room actually with Eric Moran when he said, winter is coming. <laughs> and and um, he said, um, when it comes to uh, not that much longer, COVID hit. And if you were ill prepared for it, uh, you know, cash would have not being intentional with putting aside the right amount of cash for your operations to, to get you through that would, is, was, was key for this industry as well. Thankfully, in oral surgery, we did not see in, in our groups that, that there was much of a, a dip in, in the uh, production that we were doing throughout COVID. However, um, the team communication uh, was, was what would be lacking in an order operation. 
professional management. I'm sorry if that's my microphone. Without professional management, I mean, having that extra level of, of, of team communication, we all know that there was a mass uh, movement through uh, people redefining themselves, leaving industries they were in and going to other industries throughout COVID and, and, and the, the lack of workforce, but continuing to provide um, that communication that they're safe and the measures we're taking uh, we learned a lot uh, from that um, on, on the culture of the business in each of our offices. I'd also say we learned a lot about um, uh, that would be difficult for an owner operator to do where professional management can help uh, work with individuals that are working remotely or working from home now. And we've also seen that mass movement in many organizations of people moving and working from home even more now than they ever were. So uh, managing that and how you manage people that are working remotely is, I think, something foreign to owner-operators of oral surgery practices where, you know, having professional management in place that, that can take on that responsibility and still be productive. Those were some of the, the lessons that come to mind for me specifically. Absolutely. Um, and Eric, if I can just go to you because you coach so many people through this transition of do I want professional management? Is that something that is attractive to me? How, how have you over the last several years been counseling your clients about those kind of issues? It's interesting you ask that because right before this webinar, I was reading an email that had just come through from that exact situation that's happening right now in the oral surgery space. And so there is still a fear of the unknown that's, that's in the marketplace when um, independent dentists and their teams think about professional management. I think that there, there is work to be done around that communication still with the marketplace because um, the teams still see this as some great unknown that they don't understand. And so it's, it's showing them and having the communication that, that this isn't going to change dramatically overnight and that there's a major shift in operations and that, that, that these people are, that the professional management company is trying to do the right thing by the company and by the team members and by the doctors. And, and so I, I would still argue in the marketplace there's work to be done. But I, I think as the professional organizations uh, in management are, are communicating with the marketplace, I think that will change over time. But I still think we're in it. We're still in that phase where it's still an unknown, and that unknown is scary to a lot of team members. And so, um, while it is happening in the marketplace, I still think there's a lot of work to be done on the communication of it. Absolutely, absolutely. And Bart, just a slight variation on this question because you see so many uh, different clients go from non-professional management to later professional management. Have you seen trends uh, that have resulted in a positive outcome versus trends that may have resulted in a negative outcome? And are there some lessons that you think exist in the marketplace about the professional management that are successful and the ones that are, are not? Yeah, a couple of observations that I think you, you kind of read my mind because I was going to pick up on one thing that, that Eric said first, which is um, we've been trying to steer our clients or advise our clients to really consider simplicity. And I think going along with the theme that Eric was teasing out, which is kind of this whole um, getting people accustomed to professional management. What does that mean? What does that look like? Explaining to them, educating them on it. I think part of what we try to do is say, um, emphasize simplicity. The, the, the simpler this can be to explain to people, the better off you'll be. Um, we tend to see a tension between greater complexity, which is well-intentioned for sure, where people are trying to optimize systems or optimize processes, but the cost of that is greater complexity. And I think sometimes you lose, uh, on the simplicity side of things, you kind of lose people and you, you don't get that, that same kind of um, absorption, for lack of a better term. Um, in terms of some trends that have been helpful, um, I, you know, again, I'd go to simplicity. I think that's that's really effective uh, for a lot of people. Um, I think in terms of other trends, 
um, things that people have appreciated and things that have really made an instant impact have been things like just basic financial hygiene, for lack of a better term. So being more disciplined with the way they're doing their billing and collections, the way they're doing um, payer rate negotiations and payer relationships, the way they're doing patient collections in a friendlier and more effective way, kind of very nuts and bolts operational things have been the places where we've seen make the greatest, greatest instant impact. Um, a little bit longer term, I think one of the places that people are getting smarter and I, I think it was a struggle or a challenge very early on, but now it's becoming a real strength is how do you commit, communicate the vision and the long-term benefit, especially to uh, younger, more junior associate dentists? Like what's in it for the long term? I think it's much easier to explain to the senior dentists and the owners of the practices what the immediate benefit is for them financially and what that looks like as they head towards retirement in many cases. I think it's much harder to make that a similar but different pitch to kind of the younger folks who are coming up. And that, I think that's an area where people have gotten a lot sharper. Absolutely. Absolutely. And maybe if we could just shift gears for a moment, but something that also gives people a lot of pause, uh, causes a lot of concern for different owners and operators is, and Eric, if I can start with you, the different trends regarding reimbursement. Obviously, the dental oral surgery and orthodontic subsectors have a very different reimbursement climate than we see in medical practices, um, where many of these professional management companies have become very uh, typical. But Eric, would you uh, categorize anything related to reimbursement as a concern that you hear from your clients? And if so, what are some of their key concerns and key ways that there may be solutions to those issues? Um, I think that that probably isn't something I come up across as often um, on the reimbursement side. Um, I love the last comment about simplicity and hard to pitch to associates. Um, what I come up across more often is the teams being worried that they're going to change the way that they're doing everything. And that when they go into a reimbursement and they go into software, they go into every part of the practice is what the feedback that I get with the teams are worried about do they change the way that they are doing things to get reimbursed? Are they changing the way they're communicating to patients? Are they changing every process and procedure? So I think that point of simplicity um, is such a, a brilliant point because the more complexity we bring into this conversation and the more that they feel everything's going to change, the, the more they're going to push back or look for an alternative, and there are alternatives in the marketplace, I think the more that we can come back and communicate that there's a simplicity to this and that we're going to allow you to, to do things and change certain aspects but, but, but really support you, I think is really key. Um, and I, so I, I would reemphasize that point of simplicity around this. Um, the team members are really more concerned about that than I think they are about that reimbursements. I don't spend a lot too much time on that area. Yeah, absolutely. And, and maybe I think that dovetails well into a point that Jeremy was making about being willing to implement different structures that are meaningful, um, that are more efficient um, in a spirit of partnership. Just, Jeremy, while we're sticking on the simplicity concept, I know that you mentioned it earlier, but would you add anything to just uh, formalizing the different processes and procedures, simplifying the processes and procedures, whether it be around reimbursement? or otherwise in connection with different professional management coming, companies coming in and implementing those type of processes. Yeah, absolutely. I think it kind of goes back to what Bart mentioned earlier on in this um, in this session is that uh, the groups, OSOs, DSOs, other, other groups have gotten a lot sharper at integration. Um, and so when, when we have a, a partner join us, they go through a, about a 90-day integration process where we're working very closely with them boots on the ground on some tweaks and adjustments that we can make to have that practice run more efficiently whether it be in collections uh in marketing um now we don't come in we don't change the practice management software and to uh, one of the uh individuals comment earlier the team is very um you know they, they, they don't want their day-to-day -day culture to change and that that's not what changes, what changes are some 
uh, simple efficiencies and minor adjustments to keep this practice not only humming at the weight it was, but to continuing to, to grow. And, and it goes back to the, the team members respecting and trusting their doctor and that the doctor has made the right choice as the owner to, um, to come in and, and bring in some expertise to support them. But at the end of the day, the, the, the doctor's still the CEO of the practice. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and Justin, if I can just go to you and feel free, I know oral surgery is very unique from a reimbursement perspective and from an implementing processes perspective because there is such a hybrid between dental and medical within the oral surgery space. Um, do you have any perspectives on uh, any processes for efficiency like we've been talking about with the other panelists or changes or evolutions in government or other reimbursement that are really on your on your radar yes absolutely and thanks uh, for for asking that the um the reimbursements in our area yeah can be unique because we are accepting medical and dental insurance in the oral surgery sector and so again, bring a platform where um, and systems in place to how to process that and effectively process it and, and having the follow up in place to ensure they receive the remittance from the insurance companies. Too many times I've noticed in, in offices the that is the area that you know the the the, the AR is growing out of control, and it's it's due to the lack of intention around that area. More intention is put on on the production part of the business rather than the administrative. And so, when the doctor makes that bring in professional management, uh, those systems can be implemented and and help with government payers. Um, and now, I'm not I'm not well versed on all of the government payers, but. Um, specifically around military in our areas, uh, we, we effectively build through that and have systems in place. Uh, but also, that just takes that off the doctor to make those decisions. And I want to also say I agree with what uh, Jeremy's been saying, that that doctor and the team, the doctor makes that right decision, the team is what is the key element there when you come in and, and not changing their day-to-day -day operations but they are true shareholders and they are, and they are the ones making the decisions and um, the professional management group is there to help them with these. So in, in your question about uh, payers and uh, private payers and government reimbursements, um, we lean on um, uh, external companies work for, for uh, credentialing, uh, insurance fee negotiations, as well as um, um, experts with uh, helping us build medical and dental insurance and build it properly and with the proper coding. So uh, there's a level of sophistication with that um, that you need. Sometimes um, there's organizations that will come in and help. That's great. Yep. And, and maybe if we can just going along this vein of different um, opportunities, Bart, if I can start with you because you see the whole gamut of orthodontics, uh, dental, and oral surgery, are there particular ancillary investments or ancillary parts of the business that you've seen be very successful as professional management is able to come in, uh, different practices are able to deploy additional capital? Does that give different opportunities and ancillary investments that were not previously available. Yeah, I mean, I, I can speak a little bit more anecdotally about that. I mean, on, on the legal side, as you know, we don't often see the financial results of, of some of these um, kind of newer technologies, primarily technologies. We hear a lot about it anecdotally. I, I, I defer to the operators to hear whether there's as much uh, benefit to it as we, as we hear, or whether it's just kind of... Um, Illusion. I, I don't really know, but some of the kind of neater, newer technologies that require capital investment, like doing um, kind of the crowns on site, like fabricating on site implants or or crowns. Um, that's kind of neat, uh, and I hear a lot about that. Again, whether that's financially uh, profitable or not, I I couldn't tell you. Um, in terms of just overall practice, 
we're seeing a lot of convergence amongst different specialties. Uh, so more like true multi-specialty plays where you've got general dentistry, orthodontics, perio, um, oral surgery, kind of all wrapped up under one roof. That's been kind of interesting to see. Um, but to your point, uh, a lot of these things require capital investment. And so it all kind of comes full circle back to this whole access to capital idea. And I'll, I'll be really curious to see what, um, an inflationary environment does to that, particularly one with increasing interest rates, uh, both from a deal valuation pricing perspective as well as just the ability to deploy and make capital investments in, in things like new equipment. Absolutely. And Aaron, maybe we can go to you next because you did focus so much on the capital comment earlier and uh, the concept of in COVID, the winter is coming. Uh, how do you view the element that Bart just mentioned with respect to a potential inflationary period or higher interest rate period with respect to these uh, capital deployments, whether it be in ancillary investments or the acquisition space? I know we are working really close with our clients to be ahead of that because the, re the returns are so extremely strong. And, and speaking of the implants and, and multi-specialty, there's, there's a, a lot of very profitable, and I can't speak to the profitability of the implant work. And it, it has a tremendous impact on the bottom line of the practice. And um, the return is still very strong. Even in a high inflationary environment, we still look at the returns uh, of capital inside the dental space, and they still are very, very strong, even with a higher um, interest rate. Um, even if we use discounts, we would still see higher return in the dental space. So I still see as long as people are doing the calculations, as, as long as they have the sophistication in the organization to look at the rates of return, they can analyze the investments individually and they can look at that. Um, and then they can look at the cost of capital and look at what the cost of capital is and then look at the rate of return. As long as they're able to have a team to analyze those things and look at what the return is, I still see in a high inflationary environment, tremendous success in this space. Absolutely. And and Jeremy, if I can go to you next, but just with a slightly uh, different question having to do with the deployment of capital within the practice or within the management structure, are there elements that you see as ripe for deployment, whether it be ancillaries or other uh, types of investments back in the uh, practice, whether it be systems, processes, you know, you name it. Yeah, team. I think team team's a large investment. Um, with we're seeing, you know, challenges in the labor market with the uh, the Great Resignation. Um, we have practices in very uh, affluent areas where team members can't afford to live there, and they're having to drive in forty five minutes to an hour to the practice and. By the way, gas prices are outrageous. And so taking care of team members is always uh, on the front of our radar. And then other ways to deploy capital to, to help the practice grow. It is really hard to have enough time to find a doctor that's going to be interested in a good fit for your culture. Let SOP do that. We'll do the legwork. We'll do the screening. We'll bring in the individuals and have the capital to pay for that individual's uh, base per diem and bonus structure. The doctor's still choosing the doctor, the, the, the associate to, that's a right fit for their culture, but let us do the legwork. De novos. De novos take up a ton of time. The doctors have so much on their plate already. Let us do the legwork there. Collaborate with the doctor to find a location that makes sense to be an extension of their current practice. Uh, we'll provide the capital. We'll help again with the uh, doctor uh, recruitment. And um, yeah, those are just easy ways to, not, not easy, but those are some low hanging fruit to uh, invest in our uh, partner to continue to see uh, growth that they may otherwise not need to have the resources or the time to, to implement. Absolutely, absolutely. And then Justin, if I can just end this question with you, uh, with respect to different ancillary components of the business or deployment of capital in the oral surgery space, have you seen particular uh, ancillary investments, whether it be in team, service lines, data that have been particularly su successful in your all's business? 
Well, yes, absolutely. We've um, we've what we've been using, uh, you know, and, and investing in is our team, of course, as well, and and much of what Jeremy said. I, I would I would agree with all of that. The the team is what's most important, uh, keeping everything uh, running, and the doctor. So we've deployed a lot of the capital to to not only um, recruit but also retain our team members. And, and that's where um, I've often said with a, a, you know, our operations, sometimes you know, there's comments about, can we, um, can we put up a sign that please be patient with us while we have, but we do not have enough team members to serve you. And I said, we'll absolutely not settle for that. We'll, we'll ensure those are in offices that do not have professional management that can come in and bring a recruiting system in place that's constantly providing talent pool for, for the organization. Also um, providing the, the resources to, to recruit um, providers, uh, whether or not that be oral surgeons or this discussion, uh, but also deploying capital for sure in, in technology, always evolving technology. Um, so we, we continue to invest in technology to meet the demands um, for integration and for the future. Absolutely, and, and just as our time begins to wrap up here, I'd like to just go to our last question and then also give each of our panelists an opportunity to just provide some closing thoughts on the various items that we've talked about, whether related to my question or otherwise. Um, and Eric, if I can start with you first. Uh, so the last question being, what are some of the operational or other acquisition challenges that you've seen in executing various transactions that involve a roll up of various practices and a partnership with professional management? Are there things through COVID? Are there capital constraints? What are the biggest challenges? And then if you don't mind to offer any solutions that you've seen be very effective just in our closing thoughts. Love it. Um, and, I, and I also love the comment about professional management recruiting because I, I see that as one of the largest concerns of, of practices that are trying to move that direction is where do I get these people and as they try to grow. So I, I love that comment. And it's really important. Um, as what I'm seeing is a lot of people on my side of the space are people that are trying to move into, you know, whether it's going from nine locations to 30 locations uh, or one to six, um, it, it is the struggle of how do I put this together? How do I create a C-suite? How do I have the, the right operating system? And I've had this team who's been with me for this period of time. What do I do with these people and how do I put them into this new operational structure? So unlike starting a professional management company and starting with your top management, in a sense, they're bringing on different management structures and then trying to align those management structures into one management structure and then figuring out how to operate that. And that creates a lot of challenges as they're trying to create one unified strategy. Um, going back to the concept we've had of simplicity uh, and having simplicity, that's the opposite of simplicity. <laughs> and it's very complex. So I think as, as it's really being clear on the operating system um, of what the management, of the professional management, um, and who's in charge so there isn't a leadership crisis or an autonomy crisis, so that we're very clear on who's in charge Who's in charge of what role? What does this look like in the future? And then I love that word. I'll end on that note is simplicity. How do we turn this into simplicity and communicate it to the team so we can ret not only ret retain them, but get them excited about the future and, and where we're going and sharing a common vision? I think those are all very, very important as these organizations start to roll up and come together. Absolutely. And and Justin, if I can just go to you next on some closing thoughts related to any challenges and solutions that you've identified either from an acquisition perspective or from an operational perspective in executing these partnerships between practices and professional management. Yes, absolutely. And, and those comments Eric, Eric made, um, I would have to just, I would agree with simplicity, but the integration, um, the integration of systems and daily operations, 
uh, while also maintaining the culture uh, of the team. And the, the team is used to uh, a certain culture within their organization. And, and maintaining that culture while also implementing systems that, that can be challenging. But I feel, the, again, we say simplicity and, and um, communication. I mean, just continue to, to communicate and, and over-communicate almost. It may seem as you're over-communicating, but continue to, to share the vision and where we're going so they know why. And, and usually that will work out um, any of the, the, the concerns with, you know, changes in operations that, that maybe the, the slight changes that need to happen. Um, and then also in, ro- in, in the roll-up transactions, of course, the doctor, well, if this management group or, or management organization is coming in, professional management organization, is the doctor still in charge? And of course, setting that, that proper uh, expectation that the doctor is in control of that operation, we're here to support the doctor and the team and, and create the best environment for the patient and the team. And uh, that would be probably the biggest challenges that I, I could think of involving and maybe some solutions for operations and, and roll-ups. Absolutely. And then, Jeremy, if I can just offer you the opportunity to provide any closing thoughts, whether on this uh, specific component or any other components that we've talked about during the panel. Yeah, thanks. Look, it's, uh, we're Southern Orthodontic Partners. We're not Southern Orthodontic Passive Investors. And so we are failing our partners if we're not providing support to them. Um, we are orthodontic only. We're very proud of that. Um, our view of the world is that it's very challenging to get one um, specialty right, let alone many. You look at um, the commercial airline industry, extremely disruptive industry. Love them or hate them, Southwest Airlines continues to, to come up on top on, on consumer ratings and, and reviews. Why is that? Because they fly the 737. And so when you look at crew swaps or changing parts or fuel burn or loading and offloading a plane, they're very good at it. They're very good at operating the 737. And that's that's our view. And so, um, you know, we're very disciplined. Um, we're very disciplined on geography, on approaching the right practices, because if we have failed a partner, it's a small world and word travels fast. And so we've been successful because of the, the, the small space in orthodontics, and we've seen the snowball effect rolling downhill of being able to partner with great doctors and provide support from them. Um, but we have to take a disciplined approach, and to Eric's point, keep it simple. Yeah, and just looping back to Bart, who, Bart, I think you are the person who originally started us on the simplicity comment of how important it has been to different clients and executing these various transactions. If you don't mind to just give us a few closing thoughts on uh, the you know state of the market, the state of uh, professional management and practice transactions, um, and any challenges and solutions that you've seen people deploy. Sure. Um and just kind of taking a step back and looking at the the big picture, I mean, we're, we're lawyers. We help execute transactions. We advise our clients to keep them on the right side of the law and out of regulatory hot water. Um, we help develop process around add-on strategies and roll-up strategies. We help execute those processes from a diligence and documentation and negotiation standpoint. In my mind, that's what we spend a lot of our time talking about, but in many ways it's the least important piece of the puzzle the, the things that are truly difficult have already been touched on by Justin, Jeremy, and Eric. Um, there are things like putting and making sure clinical matters stay front and center, putting the patient first, building trust with your partners and your providers. Um, those are hard. I mean, that's the kind of thing you have to build time, uh, time and time again. Um, it's not something that happens overnight. The things we do are more transactional. I think sometimes we'll tell clients, a lot of times we'll tell clients, if you ever have to go back and look at the purchase agreement, the relationship has already failed. So in large part, what we're doing is contingency planning. If you've got a business relationship based on trust uh, and mutual respect, that goes a long way to solving a lot of these other kind of process issues. So um, of all the things we talk about and not to downplay our role in a successful transaction at all, 
um, you know, the, these guys really do the hard work, and, and that's where we've seen people differentiate themselves is where they're really able to develop that rapport with their partners and, and make them feel part of something that's true. So. And Kayla, if I could add one thing really quick. Yes, um, of course. You know, one thing that Jeremy said I think is really important, which is you know, brought up Southwest, and I wrote down here strategy over emotion. Um, you know, Southwest has a cost efficiency strategy and they've utilized it well and they've specialized when Continental tried to do it with Continental Light, it cost the CEO the job. My point is that in the marketplace, we're seeing a lot of emotion uh, in buying decisions and movements. And, you know, Jeremy going to strategy is, is so important, which is, I think, in the marketplace, it's very important. You know, a lot of our conversation today is around operational efficiencies, but I think those operational efficiencies are still aligned, need to be aligned with a strategy, a focused strategy so that it knows where it's going. The business is very aligned with where it's going. It knows why it's making acquisitions, who its partners are, and how these operational efficiencies come together. So um, as we're moving through in this marketplace, I think having a very strong strategy and staying aligned to that is crucial to be successful. Absolutely. Thank, thank you so much, Eric. And uh, Thank you all of our panelists for joining us today. As everyone knows who's tuned into our quarterly webinars in the past, you'll probably be getting a notice of our next quarterly webinar here in the next month or so. And all the webinars are always available in recorded form on our website and will be available uh, with video as well. So thank you all so much for joining us. We really appreciate it.